Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, session, which will be, I'm sure, the highlight of your day. So tonight, we have the pleasure to have very distinguished guests. And uh, I'm sure you will enjoy the uh, very interesting lecture that will be given tonight by uh, Dr. Neil Jacobs. And before this, uh, before this lecture, we have the pleasure to have with us Jean-Yves Le Gall, president of uh, IAF and president of CNES, who will introduce our speaker, distinguished speaker. And uh, after that, we will have some time for question and answer uh, from the audience. Uh, we're using the uh, Slido app, so I'm sure you've used it already uh, since we've been using it since the beginning of, the, uh, of this Congress. So don't hesitate to put your question online so we can then get back to you and ask a question to our uh, speaker tonight. So thank you. We can welcome Jean-Yves Le Gall for the introduction of our speaker tonight. Thank you very much, Jean-Yves. The floor is yours. So good evening, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, and uh, dear colleagues. It's uh, really an honor and a pleasure for me to uh, welcome you to this uh, highlight lecture of the 70th International Astronautical Congress, which is definitely an outstanding success. Tonight, uh, after uh, traveling to Mars with Marsis and to the Sun with Parker Solar Probe, this uh, third lecture will uh, bring us back home to our own Earth. The first uh, outer space missions gave us a new vision of our uh, planet as a tiny sphere in the middle of the universe. But uh, Earth observation from space has brought us much more than that. For several decades now, Earth observation satellites have provided long-term, regular, global, high accuracy and reliable measurements of more than half of the essential climate variables. They deliver high-quality radar or optical imagery without hours of any disaster in the world, giving local disaster management entities extremely valuable information to respond effectively. They provide near real-time and multi-parameter data to operational services such as weather forecasting, maritime monitoring, crop management, and environmental monitoring, as I am sure most of you well know. However, in recent decades, there has been a quiet revolution in our ability to monitor the environment from space. The steady improvement in capabilities has made them ripe for exploitation in the most complex field of coastal management. Among all places on Earth, coastal zones are both vital to society. 23% of the world's population lives there and highly complex with natural phenomena and humans interacting in a small interface between land and ocean. This brings me to the subject of this lecture, monitoring coastal waters from space, highlighting the Chesapeake Bay region, dramatic advances enable better understanding and protection of these vital ecosystems and their immense coastal populations and infrastructure. So tonight, I am very pleased and honored to introduce our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Ney Jacobs, who is the acting administrator of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Dr. Jacobs is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Prediction since uh, February 2018, performing the duties of Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere. Before that, Dr. Jacobs was the Chief Atmospheric Scientist of Panasonic Avionics Corporation in Lake Forest, California, where he worked on weather observations and forecasting. He holds a PhD in atmospheric science from North California State University. Before giving the floor to our distinguished speaker, I would like to acknowledge JPL and in particular Dr. Jim Graff 
for co-sponsoring this lecture with CNES. This association of NASA JPL and CNES for a lecture given by NOAA's administrator is in itself a fun symbol of the French-US partnership in the field of space oceanography. This started, in fact, with the NASA CNES Topex Poseidon mission launched in 1992. For me, it means a lot because I was in French Guiana for the launch of this satellite uh, almost uh, 27 years ago. And uh, it has continued uh, since then with the JASON series, JASON 3 currently, and I was in Vandenberg this time for the launch of uh, JASON 3, in which operational agencies, NOAA and UMEDSAT, have become key partners. So please join me in welcoming on the stage Dr. Nate Jacobs. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm going to try to keep this uh, fairly low-key. I know that I'm competing with happy hours, so try to keep it interesting and fun. Um, as you're probably aware, NOAA does a tremendous amount of, of work in the environment from the surface of the sun all the way to the bottom of the ocean, and we, we tend to... Uh, separate a lot of what we do on what we call the wet side and the dry side. But what I'm going to try to do tonight is bring that part together and show you how we're really using a lot of remotely sensed information to do wet side initiatives. So before I dive in, and, and, and particularly for, for some folks who, who aren't from the area, I thought I would, I would show a photograph from the International Space Station of the east coast of the U.S., you're actually facing west, uh, going from, from right to left. It's uh, New York, Philadelphia, and then right in the middle you have the uh, Baltimore, Washington area, and then a little bit over to the left you have Richmond and Norfolk. And you can kind of see the Chesapeake Bay right uh, just to the right of where Norfolk is. So this is a top-down image, and, and what you're looking at here is, is Landsat imagery um, of sediment, and you can actually see the transport of the sediment, which was fascinating to me. So this, is, this isn't the natural color. This is colored just so you can view it. Uh, was actually to look at how the water flows out of a lot of these estuaries into the coastal regions. This entire region uh, from the coastal Carolinas all the way through Virginia, it's all barrier islands and it, it moves and shifts with, this, with the moving sand. And if you actually look real close, you can see the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and tunnel going straight across the end of the bay there. So a lot of the work we do um, when, we're, when we're using satellite imagery deals with uh, harmful algae blooms. Now this particular picture was actually taken from an airplane, but this is an algae bloom in the Chesapeake Bay. We tend to have a lot of these, particularly on the east coast of the U.S. as well as the Gulf Coast of Florida, and some of them can actually uh, generate uh, quite a few toxins, including toxic fumes and also toxins in the water that are harmful to various shellfish. Here's a, a satellite view of the Chesapeake with, you can see the Susquehanna and then the bay down below. And, and what you see there, um, the, the brown sort of sediment filled runoff is residual after Tropical Storm Lee went through and produced a tremendous amount of rainfall. And that is, is basically just runoff that you're seeing and on, on the inset there is the satellite imagery of this. So we actually have the visible as well as the, the measurement of how much is actually suspended in the water. So I'm going to dig into to some of these uh, anomalies a little bit, a little bit deeper. Um, but I wanted to show sort of an overall animation of this first. So what you're looking at here are sea level anomalies. And it, it's taken with a satellite-based altimeter. 
and I'll explain in a little while how we actually calculate geostrophic current from this, but the interesting part of, of, of this animation and what I'll be talking largely about are western boundary currents. So you can see on the eastern coast of the U.S. the Gulf Stream and the associated um, high and low anomalies which are affiliated with the warm and core cold uh, core eddies and then the Kuroshio current over east of Japan which is another western boundary current. So this is actually a derived product. And it's, it's just a time lapse of uh, geostrophic current as calculated by the sea level anomalies. And you can see essentially the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico going north of Cuba, around the tip of Florida, up the coast of the Carolinas, and then offshore. And quite often, once it moves off the coast of the Carolinas, it'll form uh, what we call uh, ring loops or ring currents, uh, either rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, or cyclonic and anticyclonic. So why why would this satellite imagery be interesting to someone in NOAA who's doing fisheries, or, or even more interesting, someone doing commercial fishing or recreational fishing? Um, if you've ever watched any of these reality TV shows where they're catching tuna, it's a big industry off the eastern coast of the U.S. And this bluefin tuna here, some of these fish can go six, seven hundred pounds. And they are, are very sensitive to both uh, water quality, water temperature, as well as where their food sources are going. And all this can be detected from space. So before I actually show how a commercial fisherman would look for this data, I wanted to sort of explain why we have these anomalies. So we have two different kinds of circulations. We have the cyclonic and anticyclonic. One is a cold core ring and one is a warm core ring. And in the northern hemisphere, the Ekman transport of the current is always going to go net 90 degrees to the right. So if it's rotating counterclockwise, you're essentially going to be moving water away. And when you move water away, it creates upwelling from underneath because there has to be a mass balance to replace the water that's moved away. Likewise, when you have a, a, a circulation where it's moving in the opposite direction, you have transport towards the center and that tends to pile up the water. And when it piles up, this is where you get the anomalies that are positive versus negative. And these positive anomalies will induce uh, downwelling or sinking of the water. So why would this be important to, to marine fisheries? Well, first of all, this is how we calculate the geostrophic flow. So that derived product that you saw from the satellite altimeter data, this is how we calculate the geostrophic flow. You can't actually observe the flow. On the cold cord ring side, it's typically associated with more nutrients in the water. More nutrients mean more phytoplankton, and more phytoplankton means more bait fish. And of course, more bait fish means more big fish. But the big fish don't necessarily want to swim in the cold water. On the other hand, the, the warm core rings, this is warm water. This is downwelling, so you're bringing in water that's been baking in the sun, sitting on the surface. It's usually nutrient poor. Uh, the upside, if you're a fisherman, is it consolidates the bait because the water transport is, is convergent. Uh, the downside is there's not a lot of nutrients, so the phytoplankton is absent and the bait's trying to leave. So if you're going to try to figure out where to fish, the target fishing zone is right in between these two anomalies. And these anomalies tend to propagate between two and four meters per second. So if you're a, a recreational commercial fisherman and you don't have near real-time satellite imagery of where these anomalies are, it's going to be very hard to find the fish. You're just going to have to go out east of Virginia, North Carolina, and drive around with a thermometer and check the water temp until you cross the thermal gradient. 
So having real-time cloud-filtered processed sea surface temperature data as well as altimeter data is incredibly important to, to the commercial and recreational fishing industry in the U.S. So if you go to NOAA's Coast Watch website, you'll see these tools. This is one of them, and this is actually a plot of anomalies where you can see uh, the convergence and divergence. So the red are positive anomalies, and the blue are the negative anomalies. And these are measured in tens of centimeters, although the units aren't on here. And you can see the east coast of the US. Now, depending on how far you really want to drive your boat out offshore, if you're looking for areas on the edge or the intersection of these anomalies to fish, this is where you would go. Now, these correspond with a lot of transport of nutrient and, and a lot of aggregation of bait fish. But this isn't the only tool that we use. So this is a calculation of the geostrophic currents based on that previous slide where you can see these anomalies. So here we have the geostrophic current, and you have two ways of actually forming vorticity. You have curved vorticity and essentially speed vorticity. So the curvature vorticity, you can see in this image, it's spinning off uh, cyclonic and anti-cyclonic rings, but you can also get vorticity just by having fast-moving water next to slow-moving water, and that actually induces rotation as well. So if you transpose those images from the previous slide, those areas where you may want to target fishing, these would be the same areas. Now, the chlorophyll is, is associated with phytoplankton, and, and we can observe this through, through this, the satellites. We have um, some merged Veers imagery right here that we derive these chlorophyll A products from. And these are typically associated, again, with the cold core eddies and the upwelling, which is bringing nutrient-rich water to the surface. And we can see that on the imagery. Of course, there's going to be a tremendous amount of nutrient-rich water in the estuaries, but you're not going to see a six or 700-pound tuna swimming inland in the brackish water. So where's the boundary where you can see the most phytoplankton in the vicinity of where you might actually locate large fish offshore? Those same regions from the previous two slides are located right here. And you can see that they're on the borders of uh, high nutrient and low nutrient waters. Now the inset right here is going to be an animation and I'm going to try to stop it halfway through and point something out. So as we progress through this we have um, the chlorophyll A on the left and the, the sea surface temperature on the right. And you can see areas where you have those cold core it looks like a cold circulation. It's actually just low nutrient water, the blue on the left, and it's affiliated with the warm core eddy or the warm sea surface temperature on the right. This is where you get your downwelling. This particular animation is not over a very large span of time, so this is why it's particularly frustrating. I know when I was a grad student, one of my assistant ships was to go in and adjust for the satellite drift, and I had to do it twice a day. And if I didn't do it within an hour of when I was supposed to do it, even on Christmas, I would get phone calls from very upset fishermen from satellite phones in the middle of the ocean trying to figure out where the, where the cold core eddy that was there yesterday had moved to. And finally, the, the last image in this series is the, the daily sea surface temperature imagery. Now, what's tricky about this is the, when you build a composite, at least on, this, on NOAA's website, we have a single pass, we have three-day composite and seven-day composites. When you build the composites, you actually wash out some of these high-resolution transient features, which the fishermen are actually really interested in. And the tricky part about not using a composite is these images are almost always contaminated with cloud cover, which makes it incredibly hard to find a very clean image to use. But you can again see these same areas where we have thermal gradients where you would target fishing. 
And so it's pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Most of the fishermen that you talk to, whether they're commercial or recreational, will say they look for temperature breaks. And when they say temperature breaks, they're referring to a very extreme thermal gradient where the fish can actually live right in the boundary of the warm water, but feed in the, in the nutrient-rich cold water. That's literally a, a, a boundary that's only tens of meters across. So that's not the only thing that is particularly interested in thermal gradients off the East Coast. One of the other uh, big weather events that, that is fairly unique to here, although mid-latitude cyclones are common all over the planet, are, are what we call explosive cyclogenesis, which develops as a result of the thermal gradient between the very cold land and the very warm Gulf Stream that parallels the coast. And you can see in this particular satellite imagery, we have a, a very large low pressure offshore and a swath of snow that it, it had already snowed as it passed through uh, South Carolina and North Carolina. And even, looks like it might have even snowed all the way down to Savannah. So here's some satellite imagery. Um, I'd like to point out on, on, on the far left the, the visible satellite imagery right as the center of the storm approaches the southern uh, part of North Carolina. You can see the low pressure really wrap up right in there. This is an extremely rapidly developing storm, which we would call a, a bomb. Uh, in extratropical cyclogenesis, which means it, it drops, uh, the pressure drops greater than one millibar per hour. So the pressure drops are pretty significant. And on the right is the, uh, just a satellite pass. I think this is two or three days prior to when the storm developed of the sea surface temperature of the Gulf Stream. Prior to this storm developing, this is in February, the, the temperatures over land were below freezing yet the, the temperatures over the water were in the upper 20s Celsius. And this extreme thermal gradient causes what, what we call baroclinic instability. And that really, really drives the development of the storms. But it, it wasn't always this way. So when I was a, a graduate student, I, I had finished a master's degree and I was at, at NC State and I didn't know what I wanted to do for my PhD and literally my project fell out of the sky because if, if you've been in the Carolinas and you remember the blizzard of 2000 which everyone refers to as the surprise snowstorm, the forecast literally six hours before the event was three to four inches of snow and the National Weather Service um, Awesome folks, but back then the models were very bad. Uh, we're updating the snowfall totals about an inch or two behind the actual observations that I was taking in, in my yard. And it finally stopped snowing in the Raleigh area. We had 24 inches of snow. And it was considered one of the largest snowfall forecast busts in, in forecasting history as it comes to, to at least East Coast cyclogenesis in the mid-Atlantic. And so my advisor was, he said, hey, I, I got a problem for you to solve. Why did the models blow it so bad? And I, I went and looked, and it turned out that the sea surface temperature, which at the time was measured in Fahrenheit off of Frisco, was 78 degrees Fahrenheit in January. Normally, it's upper 30s. And you can see in the image on the right how warm that water is and how close it is to the tip of the Outer Banks and how cold the land is. Now, the, at the time, the numerical guidance was using the, the data on the left, which was a 30-day climatological average, which is great if you're forecasting average weather. It's not great if you're trying to forecast extreme events. And so what I did was I went to NOAA's Coast Watch program and got AVHRR data. This was, I mean, the internet existed, but they mailed me CD-ROMs with the data. Um, it's amazing how much things have changed. And they only had two high-resolution grids, which you can see right there. So I, I 
assimilated the grids in on top of the other data, and this was the input file that we used in the model. We left all of the other variables in the model the same, just swapped out the SST for this particular file, 20 inches of snow in Raleigh. In other words, there was nothing wrong with the math or the physics or the equations in the model, but if you put bad data in, you're going to get a bad forecast out. And this is actually forecast output from that particular model run. And you can see, this is in advance of the storm, a coastal front which forms right along that thermal gradient. So right here you can see the front forming. And once the front forms, it essentially does what we call uh, vortex stretching. And here comes the low pressure right up the coast. Now to give you an idea what vortex stretching is when, when it comes to cyclogenesis, I often use the analogy of an ice skater. So if you, if you ever watch a figure skater and they're spinning really slow and they're, and they're, and they're crouched down and they have a leg out or an arm out and, and their rotation is fairly slow. When they stand up and they pull their arms in, they actually spin much faster. That stretching is what you're seeing here because of the thermal gradient difference. It causes rising motion over the warm water. When that air moves from the cold to the warm, it rises. And when it rises, it stretches out that vortex and causes the storm to spin up. That's why you see these, these rapidly developing storms, or as you know, we call them nor'easters, develop in this same area all the time. It's not a coincidence. It has to do with the thermal gradient of the, the sea surface temperature. So before I go to the Q&A section, I did want to touch on one more thing. I know I've been focusing sort of on local uh, North Carolina, Virginia uh, weather and satellite-based information. So if you're in the area and have a chance, uh, definitely uh, get outside of DC, go to the coast, visit some of the barrier islands. Uh, my counterpart at NOAA, Admiral Gallaudet, uh, went on a family vacation uh, in August. And he went to the Outer Banks, and it's, you know, it's, it's in the 90s, it's, you know, it's the middle of August. And he emails me and he said, I can't even get in the water. It's freezing. What's going on? You know, the, the, a couple of days ago, the water was really warm, and we woke up this morning, and we can't even get in the water. It's so cold. And so I went to... Um, the, to gather some satellite imagery, and it's, it's kind of tricky to see here, but right along the northern coastline of North Carolina, you can see a very thin strip of extremely cold water. So this, this image was from August 10th. And this is a well-known phenomenon on the northern part of the Outer Banks, and I'll explain why it happens in a second. But then I went to a, a site where NOAA has some data, and I downloaded some, um, some water temp data off the end of the pier in Duck, North Carolina. And sure enough, uh, in the red is the, the sea surface temperature data, and in the blue was the data when he was on the Outer Banks. And you can see the first couple of days he was on the Outer Banks, the water was real pleasant, and then the last day or two, it just dropped off. What happens here is that the water on the surface is extremely warm. And you don't have to go very deep below the surface to get to extremely cold water because you have a lot of water coming down from the north along the coast, from the Jersey coastline, the Chesapeake Bay. It's colder water, so it's more dense, and it stays on the bottom while the surface water just bakes in the sun and gets very hot. But if you have a situation, so you can see this arrow here. This is the wind vector. The dominant winds here in August are out of the south-southwest. If you have winds blowing in this direction for long enough, you will have transport going this direction. And when you start moving the surface water off to the right or the east, all of that cold water that's not very far below upwells along the beach. And while I think this is fascinating, it's extremely frustrating to a lot of the folks who do rental properties there because you go to the beach in August, you expect to be able to swim in your bathing suit, not encounter 50 or 60 degree water. Um, so that's all I had. I think we may do some Q&A. Um, so I will, uh, I will stay up here, but thank you very much um, for staying in time for a happy hour later. Thank you very much. I think there not about to leave because we have very interesting questions for you. 
Some are quite tricky, actually. Uh, but uh, especially linking with the first part of your speech uh, about the use of uh, the use of the images um, to foster some sector, economic sector. So of course the first one is a bit harsh, maybe in the first <laughs> in the way it is uh, presented. But uh, I think this one, um, a more generic one, sorry, a more generic one we have. So is about. Um, uh, what is how satellite observation are used to, uh, uh, to to support economies? I mean, all your work, all the work you are doing, is basically um, in is oriented toward the support support of. I mean, has a support for economy, but not only maybe a sector like fishery, but also for the citizens for to help them to get some interesting information that they can use in their daily life. So, how do you? Um, so how do you choose these uses, how do you observe them, and what do you, um, how do you link with these end users of your work? Um, th that's an excellent question, and something when I came to know I really wanted to try to figure out, because uh, when I try to make the case to Congress for additional investment in the agency, they want to know what the return on investment is. And in order to do that, I have to actually know who's using the data, what they're using it for, and what sort of economic benefit or impact it has. Uh, as essentially a science agency and a data agency, we produce this information, we put it out for the public, but we don't really track who's using it and what they're doing with it, and particularly with private industry. You know, that's something that it's, it's hard to find. Sometimes they might not want to disclose what they're doing with it because they, then their competitors may know what they're doing, so it might impact their business. Uh, so that's something we actually have a chief economist in NOAA, and I've been working with her team to try to figure out exactly what the return on investment is for uh, NOAA data, not just satellite data, but all NOAA data. Um, but I, I, it's got to be tremendously valuable because, you know, at least we see a lot of interest. When we started putting a lot of data and products out on commercial cloud vendors for the public to use, there's been a lot of interest in private industry, um, in the insurance, reinsurance, um, banking industry, transportation, agriculture. Um, you know, I, it's every, every single day I find out a new way that someone's using our data that I hadn't even thought of. Um, so that, you know, the challenge is sort of on us to try to figure out what the return on investment is. But whatever the number we can come up is with the impact of the economy, I'm sure it's probably a lot bigger than that. Yeah, I'm sure the, there's a couple of questions about fishing, but there is also lots of questions about how the it has, how your work has basically helped to improve weather forecast. So that's interesting. But uh, I had um, this, this question about preventing overfishing, because you said you had the, the guys on the phone saying, well, what are you doing? We need the data to be really uh, up to date and almost in real time. But if they, I mean, does it mean that they're all moving to the same place? I mean, how does it affect the way they work, actually? So, it, it, so satellite data, believe it or not, is used in fishing, not just in actually trying to find fish. So it, it makes their operation more efficient because they're not spending a tremendous amount of money on fuel and burning a lot of gas, creating a lot of emissions, driving all over the ocean. They pretty much know where to go and where to fish. Um, now, there is an aspect of, of overfishing and what we call illegal and uh, un or underreported fishing. That's actually, there's a, there's satellite data solutions that can actually help with that too, because a lot of these commercial vessels have to have transponders on all the time, sort of like your commercial flights, you have to know where they are, but they can turn that off. Uh, but they can't not be seen from space. So, you know, we, you know there's, there's ways to actually look at vessels that are doing illegal fishing um, from outer space. So this is another, you know, interesting, you know, frontier on high resolution satellite imagery that we can do. Sure. Moving now to the uh, example of the uh, weather forecast you've been using that uh, obviously has uh, impressed quite a few people in the room because we've got a lot of questions around that. So I think maybe a, a more most generic one uh, about the um, 
the model, how much has the focus model improved since the to, uh, year 2000, around year 2000? That's an interesting question because all the work you've been doing so basically has changed enormously the way we are able now to uh, forecast the weather. So can you explain a little bit how it is those two links? Um, yeah, so I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer the, the top two mm -hmm. one after the other. So the improvement since the 2000s has been tremendous. Um, uh, I mean, not just on the mathematics side, there's been a lot of improvements on the physics parameterizations, um, but really on the data assimilation front. So this is where the European Center has done a tremendous job on data assimilation, actually incorporating time, which is the fourth dimension, mm -hmm. and assimilating it in a way that you can extract information from moving data. And that's very, very tricky to do in essentially four dimensions. Uh, that is uh, one thing that's improved a lot. What's enabled this improvement has actually been a lot of uh, advancements with the high performance computing and chip manufacturers because these algorithms were actually developed quite a while ago so that everyone knew what the mathematics was. But trying to actually calculate information with that and do it at a resolution that made sense for the length and time scales for the physics you were working with was computationally impossible even 10 or 15 years ago. And now what in, in 2000, that information that I showed you in my talk, I ran on a supercomputer. I've now run what the US Weather Service called their global modeling system uh, that they ran on their supercomputers five years ago. I, I can run that now on my MacBook Pro. So it's pretty amazing how fast the advancements are coming. Um, the interesting thing is the mathematics is there. You know, these are equations that, that we know. We're just now finally starting to extract a lot of value out of those. On, on the climate change front, how, how does that affect the quality of weather forecasting? So it, this, this is kind of, you know, we don't know. One of the things I do know from the mathematics of it is we build a long-term set of bias correction statistics that we map over time. And as the climate changes, a lot of those bias correction statistics uh, might not necessarily be as valid or interacting the same way. Uh, a lot of the dynamics may change. Part of our global modeling system is a sea ice model. You know, how do we know we'll even need to run a sea ice model in, in, in the future? Um, there's, there's a lot of things that may change, um, but yeah, I think a lot of what we're learning in the weather forecasting will come back to help improve the climate modeling. So I don't know if, if, if folks here know this, but the FV3, the new dynamic core that we're using for the GFS, the US global model, was originally written as a dynamic climate model but then we realized at higher resolutions we could use it to predict weather. All right. There's an interesting question about what is your next uh, target? I mean, what, is the, what are you working out actually? What is your, what, what would you like to have that does currently doesn't exist? So what is cutting edge research for you? <laughs> So th this is, uh, you know, I've got a, I got a couple of initiatives. Um, some I can successfully pull off with no additional funding and other ones would be great to have if I had an unlimited budget. Um, on, on, on the modeling side, uh, really transitioning to a, a open source community global modeling system that the community, the external development community has access to the code, they can run the code. Essentially what I would like to do is get our global modeling program to a, a sort of community development program. Um, because I want to sort of crowdsource model development for lack of a better way to describe it. Right now, a lot of our model code is hard-coded towards our machines. So unless you have login credentials to our machines, you're not going to get very far doing the development work. On the observation side, um, that, that's, that's, that's a tricky one. So 
we have a couple different programs where we can test out new space-based instruments. I think that there's, there's still untapped opportunity in in situ measurements. One of the most ridiculously simple things is taking descent data from radio sons or the weather balloons after they burst and fall back down. We've been doing that program for 70 years. No one's decided to use the descent data. Turns out the European Center looked at it and it's more accurate than the ascent data. On um, the space-based side, you know, GPSRO, I think, is, is, you know, there's a big push in the commercial industry to, to produce uh, radio occultations that we can directly assimilate into the model. Um, hyperspectral sounders, uh, radiances. Um, I noticed there was a 5G question on here at one point. Um, yeah, you know, space-based observing systems I think will be the future because as we go to a higher resolution models and limited area models I think will be a, a thing of the past. We're, we're all going to be running global models. We're all going to need high resolution vertical profiles over the ocean. The only way to get that is from outer space. Okay. There's another uh, five minutes warning, okay. There's another uh, question link with you, the environmental aspect of what you're doing linked with if you're able to locate uh, fish, fisheries and ha is, are you able to locate as well plastic pollution? Is there a model for that? I mean, the efforts on that, can your work help? So NOAA does have a marine debris program. Uh, this is something that we're monitoring closely. Um, the interesting thing is uh, when I was showing some of those warm core eddies earlier that have the, the convergent circulation, there does tend to be certain currents and circulations in the ocean that aggregate a lot of trash and debris. Um, they may also aggregate a lot of sargasso seaweed and periodically it, it washes up. Um, Tracking this stuff is, is not particularly challenging, but removing it is, is not trivial. That's going to be the hard part. I guess so. Uh, so you mentioned the question about this 5G. I think it could be interesting to answer this one. Uh, how can it affect the quality of the forecast and the observation? You've started to answer, but I'll be um, saying to go further. Well, you know, the, the th if, if you've been following this in the press, we don't really know because 5G is not deployed yet. So, you know, NOAA did a study, NASA did a study, several, several agencies have actually looked at this and produced studies based on a lot of assumptions. And, of course, the results are depending on how valid the assumptions are. Uh, we would tend to look at, at the impact of 5G in, in the microwave sounder world uh, particularly with the 24 gigahertz, the channel one. Uh, that's the channel that we use to, to sample water vapor near the surface. We have other, another channel we can use, I think it's 183 gigahertz to do water vapor higher up, but the 23.8 the, the gigahertz near the surface is incredibly tricky to observe, and if we have interference or bleed over from 5G deployment in adjacent bands, it would limit our ability to, to see water vapor near the surface. Now, granted, this is over land. I don't think there's a real big plan to deploy 5G over the ocean. I can say that, that 5G at the 24 gigahertz, the signal propagation is a few hundred feet. So this isn't gonna be the frequency that the telecoms use in the Midwest for rural broadband, but in urban areas, it could it could show up in a heat map looking something similar to what light pollution would look like. Uh, we do assimilate, contrary to to information out there, we do assimilate Channel One over land, and the impact studies of removing Channel One over land are around two to three percent. Uh, which if I actually went back and looked at our budget and if you look at how much we invest at NOAA as an agency for model skill improvement when it comes from building satellites, launching rockets into space, model development, high performance computing, everything from soup to nuts, we invest about $3.2 billion per 1% improvement in forecast skill. So a 2 to 3% degradation could be fairly expensive. On the other hand, 
you know, the, not even the telecoms want a bad forecast. I mean, their infrastructure is, is highly exposed to, to problematic weather. So I don't think it's in anyone's interest, not even theirs. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, not particularly worried about it just yet because I think that it's a solvable problem. I think that technology is advancing pretty fast and the deployment of 5G is not going to be so rapid that we can't outpace it with technological advancements, both on the satellite observing system side as well as techniques that the telecoms can use like downward tilt, beam forming, and things like that on their end to sort of mitigate additional bleed over and interference. Okay, thank you. We're pretty much at the end of this uh, session. Thank you very much. There's just a last question which has raised a lot of attention about sharing this information. Is there any international collaboration so you, and knowledge sharing on this, on such information? Do you have a, you know, a, a program? Yeah, this is just the last one. Um, so how do you share all the information you have? You've, it's apparently online. I mean, apparently we can access it quite easily, but is it easy to use? Is it, how, what kind of effort are you making so it's shareable? So we are, um, uh, all, the, all the information we use, uh, input, output, model code, that's, that's all publicly available. All of the model code is on GitHub. Uh, you can actually get the model input and the model output off FTP servers from NOAA. Um, there's only a small fraction of input data sets that are, we're either commercially acquired or they, you know, they have some sort of national security restrictions. But otherwise, 99% of the data we use is freely available to the public. We have a, a data sharing program through the World Meteorological Organization where we, you know, everyone shares data back and forth. They run it over the global telecommunication system or the GTS. Um, I suspect the GTS is probably going to soon be an obsolete way to exchange data and we're going to slowly migrate over to a cloud-based system of data exchange, but I don't think the actual uh, motivation and agreements behind the architecture will change. Uh, if anything, you know, more open sharing I think will probably be the case. I mean, no, we're trying to make a big push, as I said earlier, to make all of our model code a community development project. Well, if we don't make the observations available to the community, they're not going to be able to initialize a model. So, yeah. Well, I think we can thank very much our uh, very distinguished lecturer tonight. It was very interesting. Thank you very much for being with us and answering all those questions. And uh, have uh, all of you a very nice evening and resume for tomorrow morning all this interesting session within the IAC. Good evening and thank you very much.